No Hi, I'm Michelle Hill from Disrupt Ed Teacher Sparks, and I am super excited to welcome John Craig from Bristol Township, Pennsylvania, who um, is very active on Twitter. And I just admire his work on Twitter because he is so passionate about his students. And so I invited him to talk about Genius Hour, which is really something that I absolutely love because it gives students the ability to chase their dreams and to find out um, about things that they really are interested in. So welcome, John. Hi, uh, Michelle, thanks so much for having me. And um, you know, you're know, you a great follow on Twitter as well, don't sell yourself short. So I'm glad to be a part of it and uh, excited to talk about, about the Genius Hour project and all, all that goes into it and the mindset around it and you know how many resources out there for teachers. So it's, it's, it's exciting to be a part of, so thank you again. Good. So tell us a little bit about what your role is. Okay, so um, I'm in my 14th year in education. Uh, the first 13, uh, 12 years, I was in a social studies classroom at the secondary level from ninth grade through 12th grade, teaching you know, ninth grade uh, Western Civ all the way up to AP uh, US history. Uh, and then last year, or two years ago, I started taking on an instructional coaching role and I had like a split schedule, um, but our district really believes in, in creating more coaching positions. So. Uh, last year was my first year as a full-time instructional coach, so uh, that's my job now. And uh, a dad of two boys, nine-year-old and six-year-old, um, who are keep me run me ragged when I'm not there, and a wonderful wife that's in education as well. So, um, yeah, that's where I'm at, and you know, that's that's my story. Okay, that sounds great. Um, it, keeping it in the family with education, and, and yeah. Probably keeping you very, very busy. And you did mention to me before that you used to coach um, high school football. Are you still coaching at all? Or I, I yeah, I, I, I've done it virtually every fall of my life, playing and coaching until last year. I, I was a head coach at the high school I worked for three years prior, uh, and then you know family gets tough and it, it, became, it got very busy, so I stepped away. Um, but I am coaching somewhere else now as an assistant, and so it, I got pulled. You know. Couldn't stay away from that because the connections you make. And so that's another big part of my life as well. I'm coaching my boys in sports and baseball and basketball. So um, there's not many evenings in this house where we're sitting around. We're, we're off at some field or some gym somewhere, which is great. I love I love that. My wife loves that. We love being active and, and doing those things. And, you know, there's something very cool about seeing your kids do an activity, especially a sport that you love to play. And so um, I'm just... You know, I get to see everything my dad saw and how much fun it was, and it's, it's a great experience. It's a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah, and what's really nice is that all of that coaching experience that you had on the field is now what you're using in the classroom <clears throat> with teachers, because I think it's, a, it's so important as an instructional coach that you come alongside of them and you support them and you right. celebrate them and you guide them without that supervisory piece where it's, you know, the gotcha. So always, sure. You know, I always uh, worry about uh, how people feel when that supervisor walks into the room. That's why instructional coaching is just so great and it's uh, perfect that it went with coaching a sport as well. So today we're gonna talk about um, Genius Hour and it's yeah. a buzzword in education. A lot of people mm -hmm. think they know what it is um, and maybe do and some people probably don't. So why don't you just give us the brief summary of what Genius Hour is? Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many different versions and you know, part of my definition of it is it's gotta be what you want out of it. Like don't try to do exactly someone else's, but I think like your truthers, your genius hour purists would say that it's, it's a project where kids are working in class on any topic, no constraint on topic, no real deadline because that motivation hopefully gets them to the point where they, they're gonna present when they're ready to present. And uh, they, any kind of product to show learning, whether they manufacture something you can that's tangible, a digital video so you know you really open the doors for kids and, and really um, transform what many school classrooms have been like for a long time where the teacher is directing what you're learning and you let them go and um, you know I think there's so many different ways to do it I, I love the def uh, the term 20% time as well um, you know some people might say genius hour is a little bit more about every kid working on getting better at a skill or, get, or learning something uh, mine was a little bit different than that um, I had some kids do that, but some kids take other paths to demonstrate their expertise that they have in certain areas that have nothing to do academically from makeup tutorials to breeding small aquarium fish. I mean, it was really cool to see a side of kids that you would never see in a, in a normal classroom and let them indulge that, um, I think is the key thing that any teacher that tries this will really feel and pull out of the, of the project. Yeah, you know, um, I didn't have actually a, uh, I wouldn't say a specified time called Genius Hour, 
but it was uh, an extension, I guess, or a component of Genius Hour would be project-based learning, where they would yeah. they would choose their own project and they would work on it. And I remember when I gave them the project, I would say to them, you know, here are just the few things that you need to do. And yeah. I don't care how you do it. I don't care how you show mastery. You can, you know, make a poster board. You could uh, create an iMovie. You could, and and I just said to them, the boundaries are very unclear. And my upper level students were. That's yeah. what you're gonna say. <laughs> yeah, they were. It, I, my AP kids, we I did it with, and there were a lot of kids who were like, oh, I can't. Well, do it. Yeah, I, I can't it, do it. Like, what, please tell me what to do. Yeah. I actually have had kids come up to me and I, go. So can you please, can you please just tell me what to do? And I'm like, yeah. guys, I told you anything is on the table. And um, right. I said, but I guess probably the biggest thing that I would like our listeners to know is that when you do that, you also have to recognize that you've given them such liberty that you better think about how you're going to grade that. Because if you slap right. a, a grade on top of that, that is going to curtail them wanting to do something like that again because they're stepping outside of their comfort sure. zone. It's really, really, it, yeah, it becomes a negative thing. And then they're like, you know what? Let me just take a test. Yep. So, you know, that I would caution the, the viewers about that because um, that was one of the things that I always made sure I did was when I gave them that freedom and I gave them a lot of liberty to pursue mm -hmm. what they wanted and how to demonstrate it that I wasn't using the great as a gotcha right and i think i think that the amazing part for me with that same exact thing i had a girl that i mean any topic when i did it with, with one of my classes she could she told me it was like whatever you're passionate about whatever you want to do and she's like can you just pick the topic for me she wanted me to pick a topic and i'm like I, you know that's not no and so i saw that struggle but i think it was such a reflection on unfortunately our education system that these kids have what i say they play school very well they know the game very well those higher level kids and that scares them because they might fail at this and at least they worried about failing. And so, you know, when it comes to grading and some people might say, you know, don't grade it. That's a hard thing for most teachers to say, Ooh, you know, because we still, we still struggle, you know, you're still gonna have kids that aren't gonna be fine the motivation. You're still gonna have kids in that classroom of 30 kids that you're gonna have to really work with to find that that goal. And, and, and sometimes the grade might have to be the thing, um, but I really pushed on, I'm gonna grade the process and not the end result. And I think that's key. And I, and I also want to make sure I make it clear that just because it's, you know, any topic, maybe a possible open due date and any kind of product, it's not free for all. It, yeah. it, it should be structured. And so that's where the process is really what you're, what you might grade, not so much the end result and, and the end result, you know, and in, in, the, in the growing growth mindset grit age we have, I think, you know, the idea that the, um, the end result might be a failure is okay. Right, because we're gonna look at all the reflections you did on on your learning, and that, you know, I, I had a kid that wanted to, he wanted to recreate Woodstock. He was like, I want to try to recreate a mini Woodstock, right? And I was like, that's a big task. And one of the coolest moments I had with him is that he called, uh, uh, he was, he found a little amphitheater, and he called to figure out how he could rent it, and what are the, what's the deal? And he comes back, and he was a little dejected, and he, uh, I said, what's wrong? I said, well, you have to pay for security, and you have to pay for these fees and those fees. I'm like, that's event planning, buddy. And he's like, oh, like so his failure and, and and kind of rejection was was that learning moment. He just yeah, realized, wow, this is a big deal to try to pull off. This is gonna need a lot more work than just a couple of buddies getting together and playing music. So yeah. I think again the process is what you want to look at, not so much the, the end result. And and the other part of that for me was I remember I had some uh, students, two girls who were horrified when they didn't get the highest grade that they thought yeah. they should get because they turned in their project right on time and they, you know, I looked at them and I said, you have a trifold poster that you <laughs> probably did in fourth grade. You've right. done nothing to extend your learning. And I told you, you got to reach. If you want that really high grade, you have to show me that you've mastered the information, but mm -hmm. more than that, you have to show me that you've developed some new skills that you've learned. You stretched, right? Yeah, that's and great. Stretched, and so I was very careful after that when I when I presented project-based learning with my students mm -hmm. to say to them, if you turn in something that you could have done in fourth or fifth grade, you're not going to get mm -hmm. the A. So yeah. you know that's um and and you talked about grading, and that's so important because we are grade driven, and kids sure. are so they'll twitch if you don't grade everything. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, or they won't do it. Or they won't, you know, it's like, oh, well. well you know, I, 
Being are those you kind of the end of it is like, yeah. <laughs> I would always but, say maybe. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, we don't know if this one's going to be graded, but um, because you can't possibly grade everything. But what I do sure. love about Genius Hour is, is that we get to see a side of students that we normally may not get to see. Yeah. So tell me about a great experience you had with a student where you got to see something really cool that you would have never, never found without this. Yeah, I mean, pro I mean, you know, between some little things with, like, again, like I got a kid that had this had aquariums all over his house and, and, and bred the chiclet fish. And uh, my son wanted a goldfish. I was like, tell me about fish. And so like his demeanor in every class for probably the first hundred days was completely different on day 101 when we had this conversation. I learned this whole side and he, he wanted to get a job at a local pet store. Uh, he, was ten, he was in 10th grade, he was like 15. And his dad made him want to wait to his 16. He couldn't wait to go work in a pet store to, at aquariums that, that specialize in aquariums. So that kind of stuff. But probably the greatest moment in, in the one year, uh, the best year I did with this uh, project was um, a girl that decided she wanted to make a beehive. She was like learning about, you know, the concern about bees and honeybees dying. And um, so she wanted to make a project uh, where she would make her own beehive and she would research it. And the cool part that, you know, the other thing about Genius Hour is there's so many layers they often get built into it that, that go unnoticed, learning and connections and relationships. And so, she, she, her dad worked construction site, uh, you know, uh, something where he could bring home the pieces they needed. So they kind of uh, were just building it essentially for free. Uh, it was just time. And so you had that moment and such a cool idea of a project. But then she also talked about this relationship with her dad that was building because they would spend time together. I mean, all that stuff, I mean, you know, it, and, and it's the stuff you see on TV and I don't want to make this seem like that moment that seems fake, but it was so real and so that was part of this as well. So she presented and she did. Now she did not put the beehive into action for quite some time. It took time, uh, <laughs> way after school, the school year ended, to be honest. So a whole almost calendar year had gone by, and I would see her in the hallway, check in with her, and you know, see how she's doing. Never really asked about the beehive. I just kind of like let it be because you know it was such a cool moment we had in the classroom. But then we got an email at the end of last year. She's going to be a senior right now. This we start on Tuesday, uh, the, the September fourth, and. Um, she's like, can you, oh, they made, she made a Google site to display her learning. That was kind of one of my contingencies is every kid's project, you had to display your learning in a Google site, but with Google restrictions, no one outside of our domain can see it because of student privacy. So she's like, can you open my website up because I want to keep putting stuff in it, but I also want to take it with me to college because I want to go to college now to stu study animal sciences and, and look to conserve bees. I mean, you know, it was, you know, the best email of the year by far. And um, I can't wait to see her next week. And, and I got her email or excuse me, I got her website opened up now and she just wants to build and learn. And she's, you know, she's not always concerned about so much. Will she end up in the B arena, I guess. But she now said to me, she wasn't even sure about college. And now she wants to go study animal science to get her college degree. I mean, again, I know this, if you're watching this, you're thinking, oh, it's like that, like, you know, you're making this up or it's TV, but it's not. And, and, and it, I really believe it can happen in almost any classroom. I really feel that strongly about it. Yeah, well, it is a, a very um, heartfelt story. And it does happen. For us educators, mm -hmm. we know that we have these aha moments with kids all the time. I mean, not every single day, but, sure, um, sure, sure. you know, I always think about when I have a new teacher and I'm mentoring a new teacher and they're so frustrated in the very beginning. And I always yeah. it, caution them, wait a couple of years when you see the fruits of your labor. Sure. Uh, that we won't know our impact fully until a few years pass. Mm -hmm. And then just like this, you say, wow, I had no idea that this impacted her in such a positive way. So the big question I have, which um, probably everyone watching that doesn't know about Genius Hour is, is it something that you can do at every level of learning? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, definitely the secondary would be, is, is easier, uh, but there are a lot of people out there at the elementary level that are doing it. Uh, one of the best ways I've seen elementary school teachers use it is like, they, they might do a whole class Genius Hour project, let them decide as a class what to do so it's not individualized. And it's, you know, it's it's letting the kids pick where to go, but they're doing it as a group or, or maybe in, in, in small groups. And so that's kind of how they do that. Or, you know, the teacher obviously probably has a little more direction on what we're going to do. Maybe we'll do some kind of community service type project. What can we, you know, I've heard of teachers taking their class on a walk around the school and they're they're journaling. What what do you see that you can fix? What's wrong? And 
maybe we as a class will decide to go fix that. So that's where I see it working there. But you know, definitely um, the real individualized powerful moments are with the with the older kids. But you know, there are people doing it at the middle and, and, and elementary school levels. Um, and, and and I also say this. I think elementary school, elementary school kids most of the time are pretty easy to motivate to go and learn and that they're excited about school. The high school kids, as, as we know, we're gonna run into some cha more challenges with kids resistance. So I think that's where that genius hour even with them. And I also, again, a reflection of our system. I think kids go from excited in school when they're young to like, oh, school stinks. Um, because a lot of them don't see how that fits in their life and how they connect to it. And so I think, again, this project can do that for a lot of kids that, you know, I would love to see, and I always talk to teachers about, let you know, Teachers always want to try things with some of their honors kids all the time. Let's try it with the non-honors kids because they're the ones where school's not going well. Yeah, and maybe, really. maybe you'll flip a switch. I, I bet there's a kid that's sitting there waiting for this to happen in their classroom. So, um, you know, it, I, I really feel like it can work at any level. So, uh, yeah. Just a minute. We're going to cut one second. No worries. Let's cut this piece out because my crazy dog thinks that he um, owns a <laughs> street. Yeah. Okay. Are you done? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll pick up right there. Okay. All right. So one of the things that um, that I also want to point out about the high school level is is that yeah they lose their their desire to be there because they're often in classes that they are mandated. So even though we have electives, I mean you and I both mm -hmm. teach high school and we know that we have electives and the electives are supposed to be fun and they're supposed to be doing all kinds of great stuff. Yeah. At the high school level, the electives even become very academic. And, mm -hmm. and they challenge the kids who are not maybe that um, strong and would prefer to be hands-on. So that's one of the issues that I see at the high school. The other thing that I worry about is for Genius Hour is how do they um, how do they fit it in? So have you had any experience where maybe um, it, it doesn't occur in the classroom? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think there's different variations of that. Um, I, I know that in our, you know, I think these schools now with maker spaces. Are creating these places where they can do that whether it's during lunchtime whether it's during uh different periods of the day where kids can get away and do that um i think that movement has, has definitely pushed this idea a lot more and made it more real because now if you're a teacher that's in an english classroom per se and you want it and some of your kids want to work on something hands-on now you you know a lot more schools have that space where you can go do that and it's accessible to get resources um and i know like you know for example and this is not uncommon uh our engineering teacher and robotics guy, they're, they're kind of generating the idea of a club this year. It's like a tinker club. We're just going to bring yeah, yeah, yeah. cool That's stuff nice. and let, let kids, like, there's no there's no guide. Just go figure something out. If you want to work on coding, you know, anything kind of engineering, electronic, robotic type fields, we're going to get resources there after school. And it's an open open door of what you want to build. And so, you know, that that clearly would be in that genius hour realm of, of student driven learning and, and playing it's play but it's learning at the same time for them and you know um i've always had this dream but uh it didn't come to fruition but in the school that i just left we had uh a one lunch and so students have that 55 minutes and i thought how great would it be that if we had like a google form uh or that we could all the students would have access to that um in different classrooms that there would be genius hour things going on so oh, that yeah, cool. they could just kind of like check out what's going on. And what I loved about this idea was that there are some teachers who teach math, but play the guitar and they would love to share their passion, their yeah. genius hour with students that if they were willing to facilitate that during their, that lunchtime period, and we could give them off a duty instead of doing a lunch duty, cafeteria duty, that they were holding a genius hour um, for students, how great would that be? And so I had that, I had envisioned this and we're pretty, that school is pretty new to the one lunch schedule. So um, the idea has been planted and maybe it'll take form, yeah. but, um, but it certainly is a great opportunity for kids and it builds in that enthusiasm during the day. Yeah. Um, they don't have to stay after school, but you bring up a good point that there are some clubs that run after school, like a do it yourself club, or just, you know, some of the things, the extension pieces to what kids love to do. Mm -hmm. um, I now work at a Institute of Technology and I can tell you that it, 
that they to inspire students to come to school is not as hard because yeah. half of their day is spent doing something that they're really really interested in much yeah. like the genius hour so that's um and when you look at that and you think that they may have had attendance issue uh, attendance problems in their other school but now they don't you have to think that it has a lot to do with being able to drive their own learning with things that they're interested in right and i, I love that um your idea, because it did remind me of a uh, um, friend of mine, at Rich Siz is the uh, author yeah. of Fort Faculty, and he just did last year, I'm, I'm gonna blank on what he called it, but it was very similar where every teacher did their own passion and kids could go wherever they wanted, same thing, they could sign oh, up and go. Awesome. And, and it was really cool too, because I think the other part of that is the teachers then showing their side and their passion and their human side to some kids that might not see that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's working on so many levels. Oh, and for me and you, because we both kind of feel the same way, we can tell by the way that we are active on Twitter and, and the content of our material, yeah. it's all about relationships. And so Absolutely. we get to build incredible relationships with kids when they, mm -hmm. think, when they look at you and think, I have something in common with right. Mrs. Hill. Um, and, and then they'll come in and they'll talk about it. I was a world language teacher and had pictures of Frida Kahlo in my room and the kids would go, Mrs. Hill, I was at a restaurant and there was a picture of Frida Kahlo. And you know, <laughs> and they get really excited because they think right. we have some a connection, we have something in common. Sure. So yeah. I love the idea sure. of Genius Hour. Um, it, I love the fact that there are people that are using it successfully. Now, as an educational coach, the last thing I'm gonna ask you is, is you are now inspiring other educators and what do you tell them the benefits of that are? Yeah, um, I think the first thing is what you just said is that when when I was able to do this, you know, part of my process in my classroom was that uh, I was, I was the, the kids were forced to have all of many multiple one-on-one -on -one conversations with me. So like during the G Sour time, certain kids were scheduled to sit with me and talk about their project. And so now you're talking about what they're passionate about and building that relationship. And something, again, I would have never had those conversations if it wasn't for this project. So the relationship building is so huge. And, I, and, and you know, to me, when, when you start, when people start questioning, well, where does this fit in curriculum and standards? Not, you know, what, from that Ted Ed talk, no kids don't learn from someone they don't like. Right. And you know, that if you overlook that stuff you're missing a big part of what we do and like you know part of me is like do you have to cram curriculum into every single piece of your day like i don't think you have to i don't think five days every day has to be the curriculum minute to minute and and, and, and you're and there's learning going on and you're, and you're so much engagement there's so many other things you're hitting and you know aj giuliani again not, not, writes another great blog post about Here's 28 common core standards that fit in the typical Genius Hour project. So you're going to hit so many things. And I love the other piece about it of most projects is there's going to be authentic research. And think about how valuable that is in the modern age with, you know, if I say it, fake news and so much for the kids, there's a life skill will need to navigate when they are exposed to all this social media and everything coming at them about how to identify good resources and know what to go forward with. So how many things are now going to be in there? And, you know, my genius hour required kids to blog and, and write every 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 time they did it, if not multiple times. So uh, website building, 4C skills. I mean, so many things just get lumped into it where you are going to be hitting a lot of things, even though you're taking out part of your curriculum that you might traditionally save on that one day a week if you're doing it in that 20 percent time. So, you know, so when I when I present the teachers about it, I, I, I kind of almost say, how can you not do this and how much more effective could it be than what you are? And I, and I might pose to 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 teachers, you know, um, would you want to be a 15 year old student in your class right now? Or if you have a 15 year old, would, would they want to be in your classroom right now the way you do things? And that was, I had that moment for myself um, to push me more towards this, that like my, my, I was, I was bored of my own stuff and <laughs> yeah. to make change. And that's how I kind of got to this point of wanting to do that. So, you know, I, I and, and you hit on it earlier, the instructional coach is such an interesting middle position because it's all about motivating and getting people to bring you into the classroom with them. So, you know, you constantly try to get them to reflect on what's going on and think about these things. But, um, you know, I, I just kind of, I'm a little tough in some things. I'm like, you know, you can fit it if you want to. You know, I like, please don't tell me that you can't fit it because you can, because 
every little piece of that algebra curriculum probably won't stick with them when the state test comes through. So how much are you missing on building relationships and engagement and all those other pieces if you do something like this? You're, you're, well, and I think you, you bring up that interesting point about uh, brain, brain breaks. Yeah, and oh yeah, yeah. And they need that, uh, they need, so if you can fit it in somewhere where you can do that. Um, kids will remember, you know, that old saying that kids will remember mm -hmm. how you made them feel, but they will also remember, I had kids that may not have remembered much about Spanish, but they remember yeah. making the pinata. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So, you know, uh, and, and 10 years later, they'd be like, Miss Hope, remember I made that SpongeBob pinata? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. So, when you can build those things in, those memories, because we are creating memories, we're creating um, how they felt in the classroom, because at the end of the day, if the memory of learning was so difficult, it's not mm -hmm. good, they're not going to pursue it on their own. But Great if point. they were inspired to learn and to fail sometimes sure. um, and to try things out um, that are different, then I think that they will become lifelong learners. And, and I think that's the great thing about Genius Hour. Um, right. And it really does teach them to step outside the box of comfort and mm -hmm. try something new and know that it's okay to fail and, and know that um, they don't always have to know every step that they can learn that you know, as they go. So that's sure. all really awesome. And I think the process, you're, 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 it's a life skill. You're teaching them a process of how to go about a new environment or just if you want to figure something out. And now we have, you know, the ultimate teacher, YouTube, we can go learn anything, anytime. So, you know, how are we avoiding that and keeping that out of your classroom? I think is, 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 is you should caution that because that is, that is where we are now. Really? So it's really awesome to talk to you, uh, a local, at least cl close to me. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really native. Um, I know you're not, you're from Pittsburgh area, but um, I am. So now we are kind of like neighbors. And I look forward to really following you on Twitter because I think that you remind me so much of myself being so passionate about our students and encouraging kids to just keep learning and building those relationships. So thank you so much, John. Um, can you tell us where they can reach you if they'd like to connect with you? Yeah, um, the best way is Twitter. Thank you so much again that, um, for having me and, and, and saying those nice words. Um, but at, at Coach John Craig, uh, you know, at Coach J O N C R A I G uh, is where I'm at the most. I tried Instagram, it's, it's the same handle. Uh, I'm a big boxer person as well. I'm not sure how many of you guys out there are on boxer, but that's been a new love of mine as well. Same handle, so I was able to brand it all together, luckily. Um, so, you know, I'd love to talk to you, reach out. I try to do a lot of Twitter chats during the week, although during the football season it's been tough, but uh, winter and winter and spring, I'm, I'm all over that stuff. And uh, I do a blog. I've not maintained it very well. It's, it's posted in my, in my Twitter account, but, um, you know, Twitter is where I, you know, is where I love to be and, and, and such a cool place to meet so many great people. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, thanks so much. And um, I look forward to staying connected with you. And we will, of course, probably chat again. I would love to. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks, John.